So I'm going to introduce our presenter for today. Our presenter is Dr. Kevin Caridad. He is the founder and CEO of Cognitive Behavioral uh, Behavior Institute, an outpatient behavioral health practice with multiple locations across Pennsylvania. Um, he's certified in CBT by the Academy of Cognitive Therapy and is an instructor at University of Pittsburgh uh, School of Social Work. Previously a registered nurse, Dr. Caridad received his Bachelor of Science in Nursing and Master of Social Work from University of Pittsburgh before earning his PhD and counseling studies from Capella University in 2014. Um, so he's definitely an expert on this topic. He's had a lot of experience with CBT and uh, um, working with clients in, in that capacity. So um, currently, and how I know Dr. Caridad is that he serves as the um, Southwest Division Chair. Um, so if you're a Southwest Division member of NASWPA, you might be familiar with uh, Dr. Caridad. And the uh, recently, or in the past actually, uh, founded the Opioid Alliance in 2017. So we're super excited to have Dr. Caridad on with us today. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you. Thanks, Tyler. I appreciate everybody taking time out today for lunch to be on this. Uh, if any sound issues come up, please let us know uh, as soon as they come up. Uh, and kind of questions that would be helpful, I think, that will stay focused on topic today would be if you have any questions about any specific techniques or a specific case example, a client example, leaving out as much information as possible in which us to, that I can use that for one of the, 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 the issues we're going to be addressing today. We have a short time. Uh, here, I have a lot of information to go through, so I think we'll mostly stay on anxiety. We, I hope, can get to depression. Uh, there are separate slides for that, but I don't think we're going to get to it. Uh, and for addition, and any questions about additional trainings in any of the the areas that we uh, address today, uh, my contact information uh, will be available, or there it is, uh, is is available there. Uh, the particularly main location where I'm at, there are several other ones, but there's my email. There's our website. If you need any additional information, questioning, one of the things that are important to me is the stewardship of social work. So please feel free to email me and call me. Probably email is going to be best so I can get back to you in a timely manner. It's almost like texting, but I very do want, uh, very much want to help uh, push forward uh, social work and clinical social work. So please reach out with any questions, concerns, or thoughts. Uh, I used to teach at Pitt. My last class was in the spring, and I enjoyed that for several years. Uh, but let's get started here. Uh, so thanks for that great introduction. And so why CBT? As you heard earlier uh, from from Tyler, is uh, is that I have a large, I have a very diverse background. Originally from nursing, and really what struck me in nursing is when I did an intervention in nursing, whether it be a medication, uh, whether it be a dressing or uh, some use of a device, it was because there was tons of research showing that this would be helpful in some way. And what was surprising to me in graduate school was how we really focused on theory and not specific interventions. And I think it really was my medical model kind of experience. Uh, and I went and did further research on that in my, uh, my graduate work, in my PhD, and I looked at social work programs, counseling programs, psychology programs, and what was taught and then what was used post. And what I found was that 50% of schools used taught evidence-based practice and even within that 50%, they didn't necessarily talk about specific types of interventions or modalities for specific diagnosis. So it's been very diluted. In my dissertation, I completed in 2014. So it's a few years away, but I don't think schools have turned around since then. So one of my missions since then is to really disseminate evidence-based practice, and that's why I opened up the Cognitive Behavior Institute and why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Uh, because as you'll see, there's a, there's a website that I'll show you guys in a little bit and it really basically disseminates. You can go in there and look at diagnosis specific and what type of interventions have strong evidence, strong literature to support it, moderate evidence to support it, mild, or there's no current research. It doesn't mean a modality doesn't work. It just says the research isn't supporting it. And if you look at the code of ethics from the NASW, we should be using the most efficacious uh, evidence-based practice. So you really have to look and stick to evidence-based practice because if there is ever a negative outcome with a client, uh, uh, you will be liable. And I know of a case where a client sued a clinician because they felt that due to them not progressing the way they should have, that they lost wages and were not able to return to work. And so if you're not using uh, and educating the client on what is evidence-based interventions and you're not utilizing them and they don't do as well as they would like, 
you're going to be liable, as opposed to if you did everything you could from what the evidence has shown and someone has a concern about their outcome, it's going to be different because there's no holy grail with treatment, but we have to at least use what the literature is supporting. And so that's what led me to cognitive behavioral therapy because I wanted to be pretty much a strong expert in one particular modality. And with cognitive behavioral therapy, what I found is, particularly when you go to the literature, it has shown to be, if not the only intervention or modality that is shown to have strong research supporting it, it'll be one of many that have been shown. And so I figured I could get really strong in one intervention that the research has shown compared to kind of diluting my personal time with multiple interventions. Uh, and, uh, and so that is what led me to cognitive behavioral therapy where I did my training out of the Beck Institute and it was validated by the Academy in Cognitive Therapy. And just in general, when you look to the diagnoses we're going to address today, whether it be general anxiety disorder, CBT has been shown to be strong, have strong evidence. For OCD, it also has been shown to have strong evidence. For social anxiety, it has been shown to have strong evidence. And panic as well as depression. So from uh, a proactive defensive stance by using cognitive behavioral, uh, cognitive uh, CBT, it's really going to be supportive in in showing that you're using the best care possible. And then you're using the right dose, and that's where learning and being proficient with CBT is really important. I'll give a shout out to Lynn Coghill at the University of Pittsburgh, where I got my master's and my first taste of CBT, uh, which was a great start as a student, but really it was solidified by going to the Beck Institute and other institutions for training and getting validated. My outcomes, particularly for anxiety, began to train because I was very frustrated oftentimes that seeing my clients weren't getting better with anxiety when I did just basic restructuring of thoughts. So where is the kind of the evidence to support that? But when I learned a little bit more about exposure, exposure response prevention, and uh, these kind of exposures, I started seeing a big difference with my client outcomes immediately. And I've been hooked ever since. And now uh, that's what we're gonna be doing today. So that's what our agenda uh, we're gonna get to today, anxiety disorders. So really there's patient conceptualization is really what we're gonna look at today treatment planning, core strategies for the four diagnoses listed here. Uh, and so let's get it on. So anxiety disorders. Uh, so what is it? So there's, as I always tell clients, there's this recipe for anxiety disorders uh, in any form, because they all seem to have these general themes, but the degree to which uh, how they manifest can be a little bit different. But typically, individuals exaggerate their, their threat elevation. So they're really hypersensitive and exaggerate their sense of vulnerability. So these are some of the things that we're going to have to readapt. That sense of heightened helplessness, helplessness, which is another way of saying it is they don't believe in their sense of agency or resiliency. They don't believe they're able to handle this. And they also cannot tolerate uncertainty. Probably some of us can, can, uh, can relate to that. Uncertainty really creates a lot of difficulty with clients uh, because of their delayed processing and their impaired ability. Uh, to, uh, to think. Just think about it. If, a car, if you're driving on the highway and it looks like a car is coming at you, you get that adrenaline rush, right? You're not looking at the pretty trees in the mountains at that time. You're looking at the grill or the headlights of that car in front of you. Anxiety serves a purpose. It's to keep you safe. What happens with anxiety disorders, you get that same kind of laser focus, but it's in everyday life when you really should be taking everything else. And so you don't think clearly, so you can't process clearly. So then you get this distorted way of experiencing both your emotions as well as your physical symptoms that happen as a result. And so it's that appraisal that we have to begin to adapt, uh, that we do have to begin to adapt. And so one of the other things you're really going to have to uh, particularly do differently is make sure that you get diagnosis, uh, you diagnose your clients properly. So make sure you're using the DSM-5, make sure you're using assessments to verify and quantify what you're doing so that you can ensure that you have the right diagnosis so that you can uh, deploy the best uh, intervention. So we're going to be looking at social anxiety disorders, uh, the specific content of it, uh, and also the unhelpful strategies. We'll be doing similar things with generalized anxiety disorder, disorders, obsessive uh, OCD, and panic. And one of the things you'll see here uh, with regard to safety behaviors, you'll see these with all anxiety disorders. And safety behaviors are the things that our clients do when they are anxious. These are the things they want to do to feel better. It's very natural. Just think at home, if you touch a hot toaster oven or a pan, you want to pull your hand away. 
but what safety behaviors do is, is just that, right? We begin to avoid those situations, thoughts, emotions, and feelings. However, there is a, a large body of research that says those things, when it comes to anxiety, when we avoid those safety behaviors, actually increases uh, the level of anxiety. So we have to identify what those safety behaviors are, whether it's having Zofran in their pocketbook or in their, in their, in their pocket because they're fear of, of being nauseous, whether it's calling a friend or listening to music or doing artwork or playing video games, we have to be able to, to let the client, we have to identify along with the client, what is really going on, what are these safety behaviors, and then eventually take those out. And that'll be kind of a pattern with all these disorders. And so when we look at uh, the model approach, and I mentioned it earlier, is there's a website that you can go to and it will explain to you and really highlight the physiological, uh, the psychological diagnoses and specific interventions. And so this is a website, uh, which is really comes out of Division 12 uh, of, the, of the APA, and it's really specific what are each diagnosis and the proper, uh, what the literature says about that particular, uh, particular diagnosis and modality of treatment. So if I look up here, just for one example, of generalized anxiety disorder, you'll be able to see here uh, that psychological treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy here, uh, is, is really what has shown. And if you go to some of the other ones, you'll see the same thing. It'll give you a level, it'll kind of explain to you, uh, it'll let you know what you should be, what you should be utilizing. And it kind of, I'm trying to find one here for you that will show the difference. And so you can see uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, you click on this one. You can see that there's strong evidence here, and they kind of make it very easy in a list. And it looks like they're going to be updating and looking and reevaluating uh, the latest literature to see if there's any changes. So, just wanted to show you that that website uh, should be linked here later on in this uh, PowerPoint, but it really should help and drive what you do. And so, typical modalities are cognitive therapy restructuring, uh, exposure in some way, getting individuals to challenge their fear level and look at it differently psychoeducation, really having that conversation with your client, as I just explained to you, about that recipe for anxiety, the over-exaggeration of vulnerability, the over-exaggeration, the underestimation of resiliency, and that inability to tolerate uncertainty, really explaining to them. And one of the, the ways I, uh, I do that with clients is to, is, is to tell them about this avoidance, how it's not helpful. And I'll make them pick out something in a room, it'll be a tissue box, and I'll make them close their eyes, and I'll tell them, remember that tissue box. I want you to think about the tissue box. You can't think about anything else. And typically, they, uh, they get very distressed when they can't think about anything else. They kind of it increases their anxiety. They can only think about the tissue box because they're not allowed. And they try to, they try to get, uh, they try to do what I ask them to do. But when I ask them to do the same thing, to close their eyes and look at the tissue box and then think about the tissue box, that they're allowed to think about the tissue box as well as other things, they think about the tissue box less. So the more you try to avoid something, the more it is, uh, the more it happens. And so that's why we have to pivot the client psychologically to then experience the exposure or the distress triggering event for them. So you want to, in session, uh, in session one post-assessment, you want to do a real strong biopsychosocial assessment. Some of these assessments should include the PHQ, I'm sorry, the GAD-7, which assesses for generalized anxiety and will rate it to severity. Uh, there's also additional assessments for social anxiety, uh, for social anxiety, uh, the social anxiety that we'll talk about a little bit is the PDSS for panic and is the Y box for uh, OCD. So you want to explain the model, uh, explain what CBT is, explain how thought distortions are very impactful. I oftentimes will hand clients core belief sheets. So these, I'm unlovable, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy. I'll have a list of these and I'll hand it to them. I'll ask them to circle what are these beliefs. So oftentimes with the anxiety, I am vulnerable is a very, is a core belief I have. And then I ask them, tell me the story from birth to now. What are the things that have occurred in your life that have led to the development of these beliefs of vulnerability? And so we begin to challenge that. And then there's a, a really good video from the Dove commercial quite brilliant. If you type in Dove commercial police artist or FBI artist, it'll come up. They have a three-minute clip as well as a six-minute clip 
that basically takes a group of people uh, and, and strangers, and I have a stranger describe themselves, and I'll have this group of strangers describe them, and you see the difference. It really shows how what people believe, how they look, how it's impactful. And it, then you get a look of how others often view them and then draw them or, or, or explain them to the police artist and how they then come out in that drawing. And you can really make that distinction of how these negative beliefs have their impact. And then it really can, can consolidate in a real, uh, in a conceptualized, in a real visual way for the client, how these beliefs are impactful. So I always explain what CBT is. We kind of outline or outline for them what negative beliefs are. They identify negative beliefs. They come to understand what these beliefs are. And then that dub commercial is just amazing. I uh, hope you all go and look that up. Assess where the client is at stages of change. Use motivational interviewing. Where are they at? What are they willing to do? Some individuals, I remember early on in my career, particularly with OTD, uh, I had them, I was pushing them too hard. It was too intense for them and they bounced. I've since learned. So I, I try to meet them where they're at with, with all these interventions. It needs to be collaborative on all goals. What are the client's goals? What do they want to improve? Try to find what is that motivator. Do they want to spend more time with their spouse? Do they just want to go out and be able to travel with their spouse because they're avoiding flight, because of fear of having a panic attack on there? Are they just avoiding going, uh, doing certain things for long periods of time because uh, they just want, they're just too nervous? So they begin to adapt and then collaborate on these goals as well as during the session. Feedback from clients is evidence based and has shown you will get better outcomes when you ask the client what is helpful, what isn't helpful what would be more helpful. Always ask them about the intervention, what you're doing constantly throughout the session. And so then there's three parts of sessions is the beginning, uh, really from the initial assessment through probably six sessions, and then you have the middle, which is anywhere from four to eight sessions, and then looking to the finish line, consolidating all those gains, validating that they're doing better with those assessments over time, and then making sure that they know what they're doing how they're doing it, how it's helpful to them, and how and how to identify if they're struggling in the future that they need to come back to therapy. So, uh, so looking back to session structure, so we're going to do a mood check, uh, and what I use is an ORS and SRS outcomes rating scale and sessions rating scale, and they look at ORS is how has the client been doing from session to session, and the SRS looks at the therapeutic alliance to make sure that you're connecting with the client, uh, and that quantifies. Uh, basically the gains of the client as well as the relationship and they correlate with outcomes. And that's one of the ways that we make sure that we're collaborating and those common factors are working well for us. Additional checking on specific anxiety, how are they tolerating and what, what have they been experiencing? Bridging from the last session, so summarizing what you decided or what you came to last session, what was helpful, what they were going to do differently, what was their homework or action plan, what was helpful or not helpful about that and then begin to bridge to the current session, review their action plan from last time, setting the agenda. So this is what we're gonna talk about today, review what has occurred over the session, which is basically implementing what you did through the agenda setting, and then set a new action plan uh, for home, setting homework and then reviewing everything again. <clears throat> There's a ton of literature showing that when you review and ask for feedback from your clients, you have better therapeutic alliance and better overall outcomes for the client. Conceptualization, uh, uh, we look at basically what is the client's fear response, how do they assess what's going on during that fear response, how are they behaving in response to that, and then as well as logs of anxiety experiences. And what we're trying to do here is getting the clients to understand where the anxiety came from, how it developed over time, and then how it's impacting them currently. Because if they're unaware of how that is, they're not going to be able to intervene and make those changes. And oftentimes individuals with anxiety have anxiety because they're unaware of all these thoughts and emotions. So we have to make that connection. That comes with cognitive awareness by logs, by slowing them down. Uh, that's gonna be very important. And a self-evaluation self log can be very helpful to all this. So what are the triggering events? What are the things causing the anxiety? They may not even be aware sometimes. What is their max fear? So what is the intensity of their anxiety during the experience? Is it on a scale of zero to 10? So you know how to gauge things throughout. We would expect that to go on, but I, I, I mean to go down over time when you're doing your treatment. Thoughts and body. So what, is, what are the thoughts when they're having those, those fears or those triggers? What are they feeling in their body? 
Do they get headaches? Do they get nausea? Do they get, do they get pain? Do they get uh, butterflies, numbness, tingling? I've had body sensations all the way from tingling in hands, dizziness, uh, shortness of breath, palpitations, to rectal pain, to inability to swallow. All these different things occur and then resolve uh, when treatment is successful. And what behaviors do they do? These are the things that they're doing uh, in order to cope. And sometimes these aren't particularly helpful in safety behaviors, whether they're compulsions in OCD or uh, just avoidance in general. And you want to be able to link all this together for the client, whether the, the triggering events, their fears, their response, their thoughts, what is their body going through, and their behaviors in response, because that's why they're coming in. To some degree, somewhere, if not all of these particular domains, they will be struggling with. So with regard to treatment goals, we want to be specific about about the goal. So oftentimes, if it's generalized or one of the anxieties, I'm using the GAD7. Uh, GAD7 will improve by 25% by session four, 50% by session eight. Uh, measurable clients will be able to identify three cognitive behavioral coping skills. Uh, they will achieve this by session. Uh, so identifying core beliefs by session two, challenging negative automatic thoughts by session five, and then doing exposures by section, uh, session six. Uh, they have to be realistic and relevant. So you want to make sure that the client uh, is, uh, depending on the severity which they come in, is that you're giving something that's realistic for the client, that they can achieve it, and also relevant. So if they're looking to improve talking in front of a crowd, doing the exposure on planes isn't going to make sense. And that's really an extreme of an example, but we want to make sure it's relevant. And then you want it to be time limited because you want goals. You want you want something. You want to motivate a client to work towards a specific end. And so this is where you want to be reasonable, where you're not overwhelming and setting a goal that's not realistic. But you want to be sure that you have it keeps you on pace. You don't want it to just be uh, just going on about it all willy nilly, as Dan Beckler said to me. <clears throat> The main objective for anxious patients is to modify faulty evaluations and beliefs, uh, to shift their threat focus, right? To normalize their fear. So, hey, it's okay that you have anxiety. Anxiety is normal. Uh, is it normal for their situation? It's dependent upon the total of the total assessment that you're doing. If this anxiety is not related to any specific event, clearly it's not an adjustment disorder. It's not normal. Uh, that there is. Uh, you need to normalize that anxiety is a normal thing. It's a physiological response, and that what has happened is a part of your brain called the amygdala is always on alert, and we need to learn how to turn off that switch and when it's when it shouldn't be on. So normalizing what they're feeling is a normal physiological response to the body. It's just being tricked at this time, and there's no negative impact currently when they get it. And so we have, and we'll go through each diagnosis and really help them to normalize that fear and shift that threat focus, and then also modify those faulty evaluations. Like if they can't handle it, they're gonna die, uh, or this will never go away. And really our goal is to strengthen their personal efficacy. What clients do through cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as doing exposures, is really help improve their ability to feel like they can fight this off. And they, they basically learn the, the conditions to do a new way, an adaptive approach, to dealing with all this, these fears, so that they're feeling better. So cognitive restruct, uh, restructuring, hey, what, what is happening with, uh, with the situation? What, is, what are they doing? So in any one particular diagnosis, it's what? Just state it. Understand what they're doing, what's happening. Where do they, so basically, I tell them you want to be an investigator. What is supportive evidence to why you're thinking and feeling the way you are? Is it exaggerated? Typically, we know it is. And is there a realistic outcome? So, is it so? For example, I have a student who thinks they're going to crash and burn in their finals if they have anxiety. And really, the evidence is okay. You think that it leads to anxiety and then panic. But how are you doing with your grades? And so, the grades have been pretty good. And so, helping them calibrate that and being realistic that just because they have anxiety doesn't mean they won't do well or if everything isn't perfect, that they will be bad. You also want to look at and help educate to them. What are the long-term consequences of, of these thoughts and anxiety? Basically, how is it impacting their personal relationship, their functioning, those kind of things. How is the effects of their thinking? 
clearly if they're coming to us, their thought process or their beliefs are not helpful. And, and do a cost benefit analysis. So what is the utility of this thinking? What's the utility of this anxiety? And if you shift it, what will happen? But if you stay the same, what will happen? And then give them uh, begin to kind of utilize that to help shift. And I think that dub video I spoke of earlier could be really helpful about that. So experiments, so these are those exposures. Uh, so what are the negative predictions that these individuals have? Typically, I'm sure you're all sitting there and have lots of clients popping through your head of their negative predictions that in some way, gloom and doom or catastrophizing will occur. You want them to be, be specific about that. And then when you go and these experiments is gonna go test it out. So if it's social anxiety is, if I go and talk to someone, they're gonna judge me. So we prepare. Okay, what are you doing? Uh, what do you think is gonna happen when you go talk to someone? They're gonna look at me, I'm gonna have nothing to say, they're gonna think I'm an idiot. And so I'll go, we'll prepare, we're gonna go interact with people. We'll go lay on the floor in my hallway. What do you think people are gonna do? And then we compare it to what actually happens. We'll lay out in front of the building on the sidewalk, get people's reactions. We'll go talk to people at Costco. I'll go model, uh, model for them. Uh, and just walking down, ignoring people, walking down the aisle, nodding, walking down the aisle and saying hello, walking down the aisle and engaging in a conversation with strangers, and then really identifying and then having them do it. And then implications of results. If, it, if with their prediction, their negative prediction is different than the actual results, it begins to help the restructuring. And that's why those experiments, those exposures are so important. But we also have to prepare them for negative outcomes because the negative things can happen and that they have resiliency to be able to handle it. So we don't want to convince them that there will never be a negative outcome. But one is that most likely, most of the, most of the time, that's not going to happen. But the rare times it can happen that they'll, it's, it's part of life and you'll be able to handle it. So coping strategies. Typically, individuals will state things that they're strong with. So coping statements, coping cards. I'll usually either make individuals go home with uh, a card uh, about what are the things that make them strong? What are the things that make them capable? What are the things that give them strength? The opposite of that vulnerableness, whether it's one thing or whether it's 10 things, I'll have them write it on a card or post it and go remind themselves and read it every so often. Now with technology, people will put them as phone reminders and pop up automatically throughout the day or frequency for which they want or time of the day. Uh, and so these, these coping cards, these kind of tips are very helpful or a log. So what are the events that are happening? I actually will get a graph paper, put the date uh, each day. I'll put different time frames of the day uh, with specific exposures or time to be present for what they're experiencing and rate them from day to day and how they're responding from day one and then over time. So it improves their awareness of their symptoms and severity. It improves their awareness of what they're doing in response to it. And then it improves their ability to see outcome change over time. So it's a very good visual for getting these individuals uh, to uh, improve their awareness and then make change. So one of the role plays here I'd like to talk about is really with uh, panic disorder. And so what is the prot protocol? So for a particular individual that I'm thinking about uh, is a 22 year old female college student who reports during finals she had a panic attack and is very worried about having additional panic attacks and continues to have panic attacks and now fears going to class that she has to do for one more time. Uh, that's gonna happen in about two weeks to have that final oral exam. And so she came in and I used a PDSS, which uh, is 20, which is pretty significant panic disorder. So I have a quantifying of this. And if you Google PDSS and PDF online, you'll be able to pull it up, as well as the GAD7 and some of the other ones, you'll be able to find it. And she was reporting dizziness, nausea, shortness of breath, increased heart rate, and really she thought because if she has these panics, she's gonna pass out and die. So one of the things I have found over time with individuals with panic attacks is that uh, they feel like they're gonna pass out and they think when they pass out, they die. And I said, well, how many times have you passed out? And some clients will say uh, they've passed out X number of times. Some people will say they haven't passed out. They'll say, do you know someone that's passed out? And usually someone knows somebody. I'm like, how many of them died? So I'm already beginning to identify with them is the reality of their fear, typically at zero. So that, and that you, can, you can see the smirk come on their face as they begin to be challenged by that. And then what we begin to do is set up is that log. So I want you to log when you have panic attacks, how severe it is, what other thoughts before, during, and after, and what you did in response to it. And then bring it back and we'll process it. 
And depending on the severity, I'll see someone two to three times a week for a week or two and then fade out as they get better. If, if, it, if it's highly impactful, I will see them two to three times a week. That is not that often, but that does happen. So you want to begin the strategy for panic is to really identify what are the, the, the triggering factors, what's happening, where's the evidence to support those thoughts of that, why that's happening, is it accurate, is it inaccurate, where it's exaggerated, and is it realistic? And so we begin to challenge that. So for individuals, one of the things I do right away for anybody with a panic attack is I say, what, what would it be like if I could produce those symptoms in about 15 seconds on purpose? I usually get this dead stare look like I'm leaving right now, or uh, you're an asshole, or, uh, or really kind of, and I'll explain to them. And I do that psychoeducation on that first or second session. What happens with panic is that your amygdala, the part of your brain, is hitting that alarm and what happens during that. And I explain when that car is coming at you. Most people can relate to that. How are you feeling during that time frame? What are you physiologically feeling? That's normal. Should you be having a panic attack during a situation during school? And she's saying no because there's no threat in her life like the car. Uh, so if we know it's not helpful and it's not appropriate, so we need to do something about it differently. Typically, this person exercised. I said, what happens during exercise? If she explained a lot of the symptoms of shortness of breath, heart rate, I'm like, does it bother you? She said, no, because I expect it to be normal during that because she works out intensively. I said, are those the same symptoms that are similar outside of some of this more heightened stuff that comes with the, the nausea and that because of the anxiety? She goes, no, it's some of it's similar, some of it is, isn't similar. And I go, what is, what's different about it? She goes, I don't expect to feel that way during that situation of taking the test. And so when I ask someone what symptoms they have, that really feeds into how I can do an exposure with them. And so exposure for, for most of the symptoms that you have with panic is hyperventilation, where you're sitting there literally with your mouth open, breathing very deeply and rapid. It almost sounds like <laughs> And anybody, uh, who has panic disorder, I would say don't do it. Uh, I also educate the client, some people can get headaches from that because of that change in, in uh, metabolism that occurs, and they don't have any chronic medical condition that would predispose them or uh, like a heart disease, lung disease, or vascular disease. I would always check with their medical doctor first before doing this with them. But I make them uh, feel the hyperventilation, and those hyperventilations about 90% of the time will elicit every type of physiological sensation they get. And typically they get an aha moment very quickly that I can't believe within 15 seconds that this just occurred. It usually occurs at the end of 15 seconds or just a few seconds after they stop breathing. Breathing, You get this crescendo of this physiological response. And they're like, how does that happen? And so what we're able to illustrate for the panic disorder at that time is, is that anxiety creates a thought and then a physiological response, that fight or flight. With fight or flight, you get increased breathing, you get increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, and you perceive it. But when it's in an area of when you're just kind of chilling out, not exercising, that you perceive it as a threat. So then you think you're going to pass out, you're going to pass out and die. So it's that fear of dying and passing out that really escalates it. So what we begin to do is I begin to have it do that several times throughout the session and then go home. And so what begins to happen is that physiological sensation that she has during panic is viewed differently, not as a threat, but as a normal physiological response to increased anxiety, which is not a bad thing. And then it loses its cognitive power and retrains the amygdala to respond differently to it. And I spend a lot of time with clients and very successfully. And there's ways that you want to implement this in a, in a strategic way that's gradual. You just don't slam this down on a client right away. So that's why I'll have them do one breath, what happened, five breaths, what happened, and work up to that 15 to 18 breaths per minute. Uh, but I'm, I've built the therapeutic alliance. There's a level of trust there. Uh, it's a really good strategy. And then what they do is they go home and they learn that they have less panic attacks, less severe, less frequent. So these are one of the strategies for panic attacks. But for this individual, she's doing much better. She's doing much, much better. Uh, and there's much more confidence. I just wanted to briefly uh, mention another strategy that has come out in, in more recent time, pre-spire for panic disorders, is a tablet that we use. Uh, that retrains breathing, not in a relaxation sense, but it retrains someone in a more classic conditioning sense. They do this breathing exercise for 17 minutes twice a day, and even of it by itself, it can prove if there's some there's several literature uh, review, 
not literature reviews, but uh, studies that have come out that show that it can be very helpful at reducing panic disorder over time in just this one, this one type of device without any other intervention, no medication, no therapy. Uh, and that's something we've been using uh, for a, a bit of time now. Uh, and Highmark just began, uh, just began to use it and pay for it, meaning. So it is, it is covered. So I just want to throw that out there. If any more questions about that, you guys can contact me. Uh, so when you look at re breathing retraining in, in, the, in the more classic sense that we're, we, we, we talk about, it's more of a comfortable location and the breath count. Uh, really, our goal there is, is to lower that autonomic response, really looking to stimulate the uh, parasympathetic, that couch potato kind of response of the body, improve relaxation, uh, and for a client to do it on a regular basis. So breathing retraining uh, is going to be a really important uh, part of that. Muscle relaxation. Uh, doing it twice a day, you're really conditioning the person how to relax. And this is all stuff that I'm sure you guys have been taught on. I'm trying to be mindful of time here so we get to questions. Uh, exposures, I just explained one, uh, in vivo actual encounter, which we do with hyperventilation with, uh, with panic attacks. You can do imaginary, what would the person be thinking about uh, when they're having a panic attack, making them visually just looking at it without the physiology. Uh, because things should be on a hierarchy on a scale of zero to 10. So you're setting the client up on a scale of zero to 10. What can you tolerate with the anxiety? I want you to be uncomfortable, but not traumatized. And so let's say they make a six. If you ask them, if we did this, what would be on a scale of zero to 10? And you want to walk them up there and stay there. Because when they get to that level of five, that is uncomfortable. If they stay there and don't avoid that feeling, the body, the autonomic nervous system resets itself over time and will come down. And typically what I do is have clients do that. And when three consecutive times, they can stay with uh, an exposure and then they cut in half fairly quickly, we step up to that next level of hierarchy. And typically something that's weighted higher at a six typically will fall down. As they get that sense of efficacy, it will go down. Uh, so, so yeah, so that's what, uh, that is kind of how exposures work. Uh, with social anxiety, we do very much the same. Uh, these, you wanna make sure you have the right diagnosis, but with social anxiety, typically individuals have this uh, over-exaggerated sense of, of anxiety. And I'll give this story of, I used to be, when I taught my first class at Pitt, I, would, I had a lot of anxiety. It felt like my, my heart was bouncing out of my chest. Uh, and actually my uh, report back from the students said they actually noticed. Uh, and so a few of them said, I shouldn't teach if I have social anxiety, which is right. That was my fear and it was uh, validated by at least one student. So what did I do? I wanted to avoid and not teach again. I did it, I did it. And if anybody knows Pitt, there's a uh, cathedral of learning. It's, it's like 23 stories. So I said, Kevin, you, you can ask your clients to do it. You gotta do it yourself. And so what I did was before the, the, the second class I taught, I'd run up three flights of stairs, get to class just on time, start the computer and teach so that I'd be short of breath and very stimulated. And I did that class after class after class. And after about three classes, the anxiety began to go away. So I, I didn't really fear talking in front of people. And so what I became to do is recognize that those physiological feelings and thoughts weren't accurate. And uh, the class reviews after that improved greatly and had very favorable. So uh, it was really my anxiety getting in the way and it wasn't my capabilities. And that's what we're trying to teach our individuals with social anxiety. It's not. Some, some individuals with social anxiety may be awkward, and so they need those social skills to be taught first. And then you work them in with the contents of restructuring. Where's the evidence to support that people aren't gonna wanna talk to you? Well, I don't want, I, I sound stupid when I talk. And so then I'll identify, so what, what makes you think you sound stupid? Well, I stutter a lot or I don't have much to say. And I ask them, well, is, is, what is your anxiety level during that situation? And typically they'll say their anxiety is somewhere between uh, a five to eight, and I said, does that help you or does it inhibit your ability to communicate with those individuals? And usually it's harmful. I said, if you didn't have that anxiety, how do you think you'd perform with regard to uh, that situation? They said, I probably would be able to think clearly, I'd speak clearly, and I would do better. So then I, I, I kind of summarize. So I hear what you're saying is if you had less anxiety, you could perform better socially. They're saying yes. So if we could address your anxiety and your perception of it, would that be helpful? Yes, so I'm, I'm suggesting, I'm getting feedback, and then I work by doing exposures to produce that anxiety. And typically what I do in my office is lay on the floor in the hallway and let other people walk by us, 
uh, I've had people sit in odd positions so that people would stare at them in the waiting room. We go outside, we'll yell at trees as people walk by, right? It looks weird to yell at trees. But we're doing things to produce judgment and learn that judgment's not that big of a deal and that most likely people aren't going to give you a second look. And it begins to, in those situations, when we force it on purpose, that, that judgment, they become immune to it, inoculated. And then it makes it easier for them to go then and do real exposures. When I say real, I mean, if it's uh, a young person and they're 22 and they want to go talk to someone they're interested in, that it won't produce the same level of anxiety. If it does, it doesn't have the same effect. And they feel more confident in how they perform. And so other things you can do is with imaginal ones uh, is you can have them write out a, a situation with regard to social anxiety and what they think is happening. We usually have them write it on line paper and I have them skip it. And each line, as they progress, I meet someone new, they're, uh, they're someone I'm interested in, uh, I don't know what to say, I start getting red in the face, I start stuttering, the person starts judging me, I can tell how they look. And, I have them continue on in each line. I have them write on scale of zero to 10, the level of anxiety produces when they're doing that. And then what we do is we go back and we catastrophize it further. So with those missed lines, I kind of go along with them. How can we make the situation worse? And I make them read it over and over and over and over again. And what we do in a gradual way is they become desensitized to that. So if they're not able to go talk to a tree with me, but they're able to do that, we do that first. So it's really trying to find interventions and scaling up those specific uh, situations so that uh, they find that they're more capable of handling that physiology. When they handle that physiology, they're more likely to handle the situation as a whole. And I we have a lot of content. And so what I'll say is I'm going to continue on to uh, one more diagnosis. I'm going to leave it for questions. And if anybody has a desire to do one of these on a specific diagnosis so that we can do uh, uh, something a little bit more with that, please reach out to me. I, my, my goal of today is just giving you the, con the, the, the general theme of with all these anxiety-related disorders is no exaggeration of vulnerability, underestimation of resiliency, that uncertainty they can't sit with, and that we really have to challenge it with thought and exposures. Those are the key components that you really, I wanted you to take home today with. So you want to do the psychoeducation as we talk about with any of them. Uh, uncertainty, recognition, and then behavioral exposures. You can use a Devo meaning like I did the hyperventilation or imaginal, where they can write something out or think about it in their head. And the goal is to, is to remove safety behaviors also, and that is where people seek uh, reassurance, whether it be by calling someone, by avoiding it, meaning if I don't go and do this, then I, will, I won't feel bad. So we don't want that reassurance. Or asking help from parents or them saying that you're going to be fine. We don't want them to do that. And then reevaluation of useful, usefulness of worry. So, so what happens when you think about taking a test? When I think about taking a test, I'm not going to do well. I'm not going to do well because I have anxiety. If I have anxiety, I'm going to have a panic attack. Then I'll fail. If I fail, I'll get kicked out of the class. If I get kicked out of the class, I'll, I'll get kicked out of school. If I get kicked out of school, I'll disappoint my parents. If I disappoint my parents, then I'll be a loser and then I won't have any value. You go through that. And then so what gives you value? What are the strengths? to make you be able to get to where you are in this particular program. It's very hard to get into, not everybody gets into it. So where's the evidence to say that you're not gonna do well versus doing well? So that's where that is oftentimes helpful. And so that I know is very quick. Uh, that flew, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. 